I was happily working for President Reagan in the White House, a dream job, okay, the best job. And then I got married. I married the Chief of Staff of the Department of Justice, and everything you'll need to know about the next chapter in this is his name was Tex. And of course, we found ourselves back in Texas, and the question is, what was I going to do with myself? Now, I like to make this sound very strategic. I teach at the Cox School of Business at SMU, and I am not above having my students think that I had this all planned out. But the real truth is, I got lucky. My late father used to love to say, it's better to be lucky than smart, but the real trick is knowing the difference. And there is no question we got lucky. On our first day, I sat down with the CEO of what used to be Southwestern Bell Telephone. And they were one of the first companies that encouraged all of their employees to go talk to customers. So the CEO sits me down and he says, Mary, you know what we've discovered? The customer doesn't remember what we thought we told them. And it was an epiphany for me because I realized that my whole life had been spent with the attitude thinking, what do I want to say? Or what do I think somebody needs to know? And of course, the minute you ask, OK, how much does your listener remember from what you say, a lot or a little, what's the answer? And I thought if anybody had studied that, you could do a lot better. So we've spent the last 30 years studying what makes people remember some things and not others, and how you integrate that strategically into your personal communication and your business communication. So I want to share a little of that with you today and also put in a plug for communication as a key leadership tool. And we're going to do it all by looking at examples. The first thing that we discovered is that the fundamental principle of communication is we pick up and repeat each other's words. It's fascinating. Okay, if you listen to a conversation, you can see it happening. And there are what we call good words. Those are the words you want people to pick up and repeat. And of course, the opposite from good words would be bad, bad words, right? And it turns out to be remarkably easy to figure this out. This is the reporter who moved next to vice presidential candidate Sarah Palin to write a book about her. There are people on the other side of the coin who, and Joe, they say this is a little creepy. Okay, negative word is? Creepy. creepy. How do you respond to that? Well, you know, creepy is as creepy does. If I lived here and did something creepy, if I did what Sarah Palin is suggesting that I moved here because I had some desire to do, that would be creepy. And the word he has pounded home is creepy. creepy. Right. Um, if you tune up your ears, you can see how this works. There are several groups of people who really do this a lot, reporters, financial analysts, and for any of you who have ever been to town hall meetings, we've socialized people to behave that way at town hall meetings. And it looks like this. Kelly. Your critics say this reveals that you are a political bully. Okay, negative word is? Bully. bully. Right, see how good you are? <laughs> We're gifted. Your style is payback. Are you, and does this compromise your ability to serve? No, I'm not. Because I am who I am, but I am not a bully. And of course, the quote becomes, I am not a bully, right? Um, this is the first lesson in communication. It's the most common mistake, but it's also, interestingly, the easiest one not to fall into. That is repeating and denying a negative word. Now, the reason it's important is because our new definition of communication asks, who's the audience? And how do I influence what they hear, what they believe, and what they remember? And when you repeat and deny a negative, people are actually likely to overlook the denial. They hear the opposite of what the speaker is trying to say. It's fascinating. And we named the genre after a young woman caught with a high profile, but unfortunately married man. And she held a press conference, as you can see, and announced, I'm not a bimbo, thus causing everybody to think. She She's a bimbo, bimbo. right. Um, I put out a bimbo memo on a monthly basis. We're the three best bimbos of the month. I'm particularly fond of headlines. And this is actually my favorite in this montage because PepsiCo is a great marketing company. And they would never take out an advertisement that says Doritos are not bad for you. And yet there's their CEO, who's a legend in her own right, slipping into the, the trap, repeating the negative. Notice it crowds out the positive, And again, it rises to become the headline. Probably my all-time favorite bimbo is Mike Tyson's comment, you called me a recluse rapist, I'm not a recluse. <laughs> <laughs> Took a minute for that to sink in. Huh? <laughs> the, um, if you use a negative word, it's going to replicate itself. And uh, to me, this is such common sense. You would think that large companies know this, but frequently they don't. Here's Mary Barra, the CEO 
of General Motors. And, and like I said, I you know, a simple thing I said to him is no more crappy cars. Okay. Now you're all great at this. Obviously, the bad words are crappy, crappy cars. cars. <laughs> and that resonates, uh, you know. I said, okay, yeah, deal, you're yeah, on. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think there were sometimes so many uh, boundaries put on them that we, we didn't give them a recipe for success. All right, give me a concrete example of a crappy car or a crappy innovation in a car, a crappy piece of a car. <laughs> and I promise you that tomorrow morning when you think about this, you'll remember crappy cars, right? Um, so I said, we put out a monthly memo and the three winners, the people who submit them get an orange ribbon. Highly coveted, suitable for display. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can click through to what we call the full bimbo, which has got everything that I've collected over the years. Now, therefore, you have to tell me what your good words are and why. And that's the key strategic part, not just what they're good for, but why. So here's Paul Harrington of Easton Bell Sports. Uh, Easton Bell is a holding company, and they own a number of sporting good equipment manufacturing facilities, including a company called Riddell Helmets, which means we are squarely in the middle of what controversy? Concussions. Concussions. You think, okay, this is pretty easy. You buy a helmet because it will keep your player safe. safe. Yeah. Yes, but we can't say that. Any guesses as to why not? Liability is one, but liability because as a claim, it's not true. Not true. <laughs> right. Now that's sort of a problem if you're trying to think about the communication strategy for the company, but Paul is rebuilding the company on a different word. Is there one overarching philosophy you have when running the company? Innovation. Paul says if we think of ourselves as an innovation company, it changes how we recruit people. If we think of ourselves as an innovation company, it changes our manufacturing process. Those things change our relationship with our customer. Now here's the interesting thing. Paul expects every employee of every one of their companies to be able to give you those two lines. Absolutely innovation. In our world, uh, in sporting goods equipment, innovation is the key. Now the next thing, <clears throat> which you've thought about this, is to say, okay, how do we get everybody in the company as our part of the articulation, that is, we've thought about what the anchor words are, and one of my favorite employee engagement techniques is called a good word wall. It's just a simple opportunity where you say to your employees, we're interested in what you'd like people to think of the company. Just a couple of words, and you let them articulate it on video. Here's somebody who works for Florida Power and Light. First and foremost, I think it's ethical. And uh, combine that with a customer focus and, and a, just a friendly company. Uh, the people I have always worked with have, uh, have been all shown that kind of attitude. You think that's what we want people to think of when we think of our company? So words are your first tool because people pick them up and repeat them. And if you thought through what are our positive anchor words and you thought of how you get people involved in them, you can create a very powerful dynamic. While we're together, I want to say a word about statistics, not only because they, they cause so much trouble in communication, but because they're an example of leadership. So here's Martha Stewart. And at this moment, she's on trial for insider trading. Now, if you are on trial, your fate rests with the members of the jury. jury. Okay, so they're our target audience. How much money did you actually save by selling your implant stock the day before that announcement? I think it amounted to approximately $40,000. And 40,000 bucks to an average juror, that's, that's a lot of money. That's a year's salary. About point zero zero six percent of my net worth okay <laughs> i just bring the examples i just bring the examples did the jury like her no no the jury hated her and here's the lesson for this martha hired the people who told her what she wanted to hear instead of what she needed to hear and that's a key leadership lesson i had the great honor of serving the director of the FBI, and I got there in his third year. I was the only non-lawyer and one of only two women on his staff. And all the divisions had liaisons with the director's department except identification, which was fingerprints. None of the lawyers wanted fingerprints. They wanted foreign counterintelligence and criminal and stuff that was sexy. So I got fingerprints, and it, we were just starting a transition of 95 million paper files through the process of automation. So I went to Judge Webster and I said, 
can you give me a little more direction about my job? And he said, your job is to make sure that I hear things that people think I don't want to hear or that they don't want me to hear. And by the end of that day, it was perfectly clear what that meant. For my students at Cox, we're now looking at what's happening to Boeing, the company I'm sure you're all reading about in the newspaper, a perfect example of a company that did not understand the importance of setting up an information <laughs> system so the people at the top heard what they needed to hear and not what they wanted to hear. And there's a key difference in that. Time is going to go by very quickly, so I hope that these brief lessons about words and statistics will stick with you. And let me close with a story about my old boss, Ronald Reagan, who was really one of a kind. When I was at the White House, the president's time was booked in five-minute increments, and it was very formal. And if the president was going to do even a ceremonial drop-by to your group, you got the mole settled, and then you went and you notified the duty officer, we're ready. Okay. So I had the script towers editors in. I get them all settled. And I go find the duty officer. No duty officer. Okay. So uh, we, um, we wait. Nothing. So I walk across the hall to his secretary's office, and I say, um, we're all ready. Um, and she said, well, he's in the cabinet room. You can go knock on the door. This is not portable. So I went knock on the door. The voice says, come in. Okay. And I went in. He's there, jacket off, half glasses, papers everywhere. And he looks at me. He says, Mary, you're a woman. <laughs> yes, sir. But he gathered up all his papers and told me what he was doing. He kept up a decades-long correspondence with the great comedic writers of the day. And they would send him material. And so he would periodically look over it and make it his own. And I happened to wander by his take while he was thinking of making a bond with young professional women. My last event at the White House was to take in Glamour Magazine's Outstanding Working Women of America to meet the president. And even something like that that's just a photo op is a very big deal for the people who are participating in it. So we get all the ladies lined up. President comes in and he says, what an outstanding group of women. It reminds me of a story. A man is walking along and he collapses. A woman pedestrian kneels at his side. Up comes another man. He elbows her aside and he says, I've had CPR. Let me handle this. So he leans down to the fallen man and he begins to go through the checklist, check his tie, check his breathing. And the woman reaches down. She taps his <coughs> arm and she says, when it gets to the part where it says, call a doctor, I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> the meeting went great, but there's actually a little addendum that I want to tell you about because um, in even a ceremonial visit like that, people will come from the, the attendee's hometown to cover it. And one of the women in this group was the only woman warden of a male prison, six feet two, African-American, very impressive, from Hartford, Connecticut. So she comes out afterwards onto the uh, White House lawn, and Hartford TV runs up to her because they think she's going to trash the president. And they stick a microphone in her face. They say, OK, what'd you think? How'd you do it? She looks straight into the camera, and she says, you know, when you talk to that guy, he changes your mind. <coughs> And that's really what we're talking about today. When you talk to people, you change their mind. Okay? Leave with these last couple of lessons. You can actually influence, if not control, the words people pick up and repeat. And when you think about the ones that represent how you want to be perceived, you can control that. And don't end up like Martha Stewart. Remember, statistics can lie. So I hope these lessons are useful. You get good by practice. Okay? Don't qualify for any of the bimbos. And of course, true to what this event is called, what we want you to do is speak up. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.